This podcast was made possible by our Leadership Circle members, Becky Morgan, Randy Pond, Lisa Sonsini, and Silver Lake. Special thanks to our 2020 Exemplary Leadership Award sponsors, Friends of Sing Kong, Friends of Webb McKinney, Eris Communications, Deloitte, and HP Inc., and to our Truth, Love, and Reconciliation Dialogue Series sponsor, Destination Home. Welcome to The Dialogue. I'm Suzanne St. John Crane. Mark and Jane, it's so great to have you both here. Just delighted that you were able to make this uh, this time and this podcast work. Uh, excited to talk to you about your work as well as uh, the sustainability affinity group that you, you've had going here at ALF and advice you have for us, guidance you have for us as folks that have been working in sustainability for a very long time. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love you to to talk a little bit about, I mean, you've you've really worked in the space for a long time in different capacities. Uh, and you know, Jane, why don't you kick it off? Just curious, you know, how you've dedicated your your career, woven sustainable practices into your work, your community, your advocacy. Talk to us about your background a bit in this. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Um, you know, it's an interesting question to think about where my sense of environmental stewardship started. Uh, But I I think it really started from where I grew up. I grew up in Connecticut, just steps from the Connecticut River, spent most of my childhood outdoors, either in the water or on the water, moving to California, having a family. And I think when you have kids, you're immediately thinking about their health every moment. So I think that really influenced me as well. We moved to Half Moon Bay specifically to give our kids the kind of environment we wanted them to have. Um, And then in my work, you know, I was initially working for PG&E and then started my own company. And, you know, environmental sustainability and stewardship was just, it was just always the way I moved in the world. And, and then, of course, most recently, Miramar Farms has just been really doubling down on those efforts to, to really not only for ourselves, but to demonstrate what's possible. Yeah, so it's been a journey, but it, it starts with those New England roots, I think. Love it. How about you, Mark? You know, some interesting similarities. I grew up in California, and it was the outdoors. It was the Sierras and the ocean, I think, that kind of gave me a visceral sense of connection to creation. Um, I remember being nine or 10 years old around 1970 in Palo Alto, and they have the May Day Parade. And for a couple of years running, I made a little go-kart. Um, and the, the theme of the go-kart was transportation that would only emit water vapor. Um, so even as a little kid, that was sort of in the ethos. Um, and uh, I went on to do a degree program at the University of California in business uh, management and environmental systems, uh, purposefully coupling the two as a kind of a framework in systems thinking. Um, and then wherever I was in my career in technology or or what have you, um, networking and the internet, um, nights and weekends and, and at work, I was always thinking about it. Um, so it's kind of always been there. You, once once you kind of feel that connection, I think you, you, it's just there. It's part of you. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think my, my connection to the earth and to nature, all things um, natural has really grown since coming to ALF, right? And just going to that Gold Lake trip every year has, uh, mm-hmm. has deepened my love for the outdoors, certainly, and my awareness of our, our impact on it. So I'd love to, you know, dive in here just talking about this IPCC report that came out in August that, you know, I don't follow these reports closely like you two do, but this stood out for me and and really scared me, frankly, a little bit. And just one of the quotes from, from the report, you know, says strong and sustained reductions in emissions of carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions. Uh, and other greenhouse gases would limit climate change. While benefits for air quality would come quickly, it would take 20 to 30 years to see global temperatures stabilize. Have we broken nature? <laughs> what have we done? I, um, you know, Suzanne, it's, uh, it's so interesting when I hear you and others even ask this question. I have to sort of, I feel myself heat up inside because I'm so angry. Yeah. And it's, I'm not angry at the question, but we have known this for such a long period of time. And to, you know, I have followed this closely. I went to the uh, IPC, IPPC 
did a presentation um, and in Cal in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and then they were saying if we can keep it below a degree and a half, or, uh, you know, we'll be okay. And these are the mm -hmm. things we can do. And of course, we we didn't do that. And so here we are. And so um, I also think back to uh, this is pretty um, very formative for me. Um, Al Gore, remember him? Al Gore and Inconvenient do. Truth. Yeah. I saw him speak at Stanford in, it must have been 2003 or 2004. It was before the movie existed. He had a slideshow and he was going around the country giving it at universities. And I was there with my teenage son. And, you know, again, talking about the temperatures and the predictions of where we are now. So that's, you know, 20 years ago, almost. It's a long yeah. time. And so it's, it's, um, it is frustrating to, to, be dealing with it. But here's the good news. I do think that we are starting to see a social tipping point, if you will, that people are saying, yeah, we have broken the regenerative cycle of nature. And we have a huge responsibility to figure out how to set this right. Um, I think the tr troubling news is, according to every climate scientist I talked to, between now and 2050, things are going to get worse. And that's yeah. built in, and there's not a lot we can do about that. Uh, but our potential to act now to start to shift the curve after that period of time is incredibly important. I mean, yeah, Mark, I'm sure you can say more about this. Well, I think what you said about breaking the regenerative cycle is so profound. Um, one of the aspects of this whole climate crisis is the, the number of lenses or languages that you can use to talk about it. Um, you can speak spiritually, as the Pope has done, Dalai Lama and many others, uh, quite deeply about what's what's happening in our role in it talk economically you can talk psychologically it's all so many ways economically it's just many many different uh points of view and what's changed for me the last couple of years is we we are in a different phase right now um the uh run up to impact is over the accelerators from a systemic perspective are fully in place and we are still emitting more carbon every single year than we ever have in history even with all the rhetoric and talk about doing something about it so when i i think about this i i have more and more channeling greta thunberg who has a, a sort of clear eye to what's happening and um, we're out of time the impacts are on almost every human being now and it's going to get a lot lot worse and the point isn't to be pessimistic um, or doomsday about it. It's to be clear eyed and realistic and say, we're, we're at a point where the worst gets a lot, lot worse, a lot faster. And it impacts other you know, intersectional issues of equity and inclusion, of poverty, of, of sort of politics, uh, everything. Um, and so the, the wake up call period is finished and the time for radical solutions that are deterministic, meaning get the level of carbon down, is here. And that's what that IPCC report says is, uh-oh, <laughs> we've turned a corner here. It's way worse than we even told you before. Wake up and let's get moving. I'd love to ask each of you too, and Mark, why don't you start just practically speaking, you know, how have you changed your behavior in the last few years? You talk about just the, the urgency and the acceleration right now that this report reveals and that you've seen in your studies and your work. Um, what, have, what have you done? What have you changed in the last few years? Well, I think quantifying is important in just sort of the, the global, and I'll bring it back to local and myself. Um, normal for the last 20,000 years has been about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, 350 is that sort of magic, gosh, if we kept it to that point, we'd only raise temperatures 1.5 degrees Celsius. We've raised them one degree so far, so that would be sort of bad, but not too bad. And we're at 420 and rising rapidly. Um, so the, the thing that we all have to do is get to zero, like really zero, not, not sort of part way. Um, and so I thought about that in, in three kind of dimensions of my life, uh, at home, uh, at work and as a citizen, 
And I think there's kind of different calls to action for each one of those. And, and certainly during the pandemic, I turned inward a little bit and said, all right, we've done a lot of things about conserving and, and uh, having good insulation and light bulbs that are LED and stuff like that. But what are really the biggest pools of carbon that we emit still? And how could we get them like really to zero? Could we do it? Um, and so I've, we've finished the transition to all electric cars at home. Um, I've converted to a heat pump um, air system. So we now have cooling as well as heating and air filtration for all the smoke. Um, we've changed our water heater out to a heat pump water heater. There's all sorts of incentives and help economically to make that affordable or more affordable. Um, and we've uh, offset our travel, which is sort of the hardest one to, to reduce, but mm. we're down about 90%. And I don't say that to brag, I just say zero is the goal and we're making progress. And, and I think all of us need to have a plan that's urgent and, and immediate about what, you know, what are our big pools of carbon in our household and how do we get them to zero? Jane, how about you? What have you uh, changed? Have you modified your habits the last few years? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I am both inspired and join uh, Mark in all the sort of household hardware things that you can do. So we have solar and battery backup. We've had an energy audit and, you know, sort of tightened everything up. And there, as Mark says, there's so many programs available and there will be more coming. There's a lot of investment going on. And we're very fortunate in California to see that. So all those things. Um, the, the two other things I'll mention, I'm very excited about. We just had a presentation on Friday for a conservation and carbon farm plan for Miramar Farms. So we have 11 acres here. We can manage that land in a certain way to both draw down carbon and um, and to increase uh, the, the stewardship of the property. So we're, we're taking that on and that'll be sort of a five to 10 year effort, but we are front loading as much as we can with some of those land practices. And then the last thing I have to mention is that about, um, let's see, six years ago now, I um, was appointed to the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. So that's a, a, a public office that uh, oversees water quality throughout the Bay region. Big focus on um, climate change mitigation in particular because of the sea level rise that we will see around the bay. So, but my point there is um, public service. Like right. these are significant issues and to have people engage, um, yes, by voting, yes, by all the things you can do in your community, but to think about where, you know, you can serve by your, you know, your expertise or your background is can you bring some of that to the public sector, there's so much need for leadership. So I'm really um, pleased to be able to do that. So appreciate your service there too, Jane. Thank you for stepping up and doing that. And Mark, yeah, I'm, I'm going to strive to uh, uh, to reach that that zero number as well and appreciate your, uh, your example. How, how can people measure or find out where they're at in terms of their, their carbon footprint? Mark, do you have a... There's more and more tools. There are carbon calculators. You can Google them online. <clears throat> that'll help you enter some information about how you know what's your commute like and where's your electricity from, which utility, and they kind of help help you figure that out. Um, and it's really helpful to have. There's a, a, a resource I'd point people to called Drawdown.org, and Drawdown.org did an extensive research globally about how do you get to zero. Uh, it, you know, at a global level, at a state level, at your house and your work, and they have a whole bunch of tools and. And uh, included in that is a philosophy of go after the biggest pools first. So which which are not the not the plastic straws, which also matter, but but the uh, where does your electricity come from? How do you move yourself in a vehicle, and and how do you uh, power your house? Or the kind of the big three for most of us. Um, and and uh, then look for solutions. But there are ways to quantify that and find out what those big uh, pools are. It turns out that eating actually is one. So there's behavioral things we can do and not getting all acidic and living in a cave, but you know, maybe reducing beef by one or two days a week um, and having it a little bit less. And that turns out to be a pretty big pool of carbon, for example. So there are really doable um, actions that people can take, but I'd just say start start with the biggest pools first and work down. And that applies both at home and at work and in, from a policy perspective. I want to go back to 
government's role here, right? I, I know that when we had an initial conversation about this podcast, you had mentioned a book or you know, a report that came out in the 50s talking about climate change. This has been known and, and predicted um, here locally and internationally. Uh, gosh, I, just the research I did shows 18... 96, the Swedish scientists had predicted that changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide, you know, levels could substantially alter the, the surface temperature through the greenhouse effect. 1938, another report came out about carbon dioxide increases Earth's atmosphere to global warming. Where are the profiles encouraged here, right? I mean, what is holding us back from listening to this and responding to it faster? Well, I'll just say that 1896, when I think it is, is, was a woman scientist who was roundly ignored. So part of it is listening to those important voices. But yeah. um, the, the book that we chatted about was called They Knew. Um, we'll put out a reference for it, but um, it's by one of the expert witnesses, scientists in the uh, Children Against U.S. Government case, saying that the U.S. government has deprived us all of the, the ability to pursue long-term happiness and and uh, freedom and and uh, you know good lifestyle because they have not acted on what they knew, and this they knew book goes back to the 1950s and 60s and says we we did know in 1965 a White House uh, council advisory council said hey carbon's going to double by 2000 and we're going to have big impacts on human beings by 2000 we better do something, and uh, Lyndon Johnson ignored it <clears throat> and he kind of they go through the the kind of scholarly data of each government and what did they know and what did they do about it? And both parties didn't do it to your point about profiles and lack of courage. So, you know, it turns out human beings, uh, not to give us an out, but uh, we're really good when faced with a tiger in our face and running very right. quickly to get away from the threat. And we're very, very poor at things that go on longer than a couple of years or a decade or a century. Um, and this is the mother of all tigers right in front of our faces. Uh, it's just a long-term one. So it's it's hard for us to process that. Um, and, and yet now here we are today, can't change history. Um, we have a hell of a lot of data. We know exactly what's going to happen. And they actually knew back into the Carter administration what and when these effects would be acute. And it's right now. Uh, and so we have an opportunity to stop the curve increasing of emissions and, and get to zero. And it's Right now, it's not yesterday. And I know a lot of my friends say, well, you know, it's still long term. Our kids will deal with it. We failed too bad. My, my kids will have to handle it. And I just, I bristle when that comes up. It makes me sad and angry at the same time um, that uh, these solutions are at hand. They are affordable. We can include people, all people uh, in diversity and actually lift people up as part of a transition. And it's just a matter of, of will and a sense of urgency to get it done. Yeah. Jane, I'd love to get your your thoughts on, you know, speaking of the tiger in our faces, right? Not everybody sees that tiger. I mean, climate deniers has been a thing, right? It has been a real thing. And I'm curious if just in your observations or readings, are you hearing less and less of that given the extreme and unpredictable weather events that we've been experiencing from the fires to the hurricanes? Um, you know, are people kind of coming around to the fact that this is real and it's here? I, I think they I think they are. I think people are seeing that this, as Mark says, is a tiger in our face and it's right there and it's taking the form of floods and fires and smoke filled skies. And we're seeing them in Germany and we're seeing them in the southern United States and California and the West. So it's increasingly impossible to ignore and it's increasingly impossible that uh, you know, almost everyone is impacted in one way or in an, an another or another. And while that's challenging and difficult and, 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 and sad in so many ways, there is, because we can't uh, ignore it any longer, we're going to have to face it. And so I think, uh, you know, that the both at the state level and the federal level, the money that we're starting to see flow and materialize in the billions to start to address some of this is it's a positive thing. Um, I also was, you know, as I talked to other leaders and business leaders in the venture area as well in Silicon Valley, uh, climate 
uh, response is becoming a very hot topic in terms of business development and opportunities. And so, you know, in a lot of ways that makes me optimistic as well that things will start to to move not only in the public sector, but in the private sector as well to support um, uh, the shift, some of the shifts we need. And, you know, one thing I, I think we should be really clear about, by the way, is when we talk about the need for change and um, movement to address this, we are heavily talking about the United States and China. So it's not someplace else. It is us. It is here. We, you know, produce the most carbon. And, you know, so our it's, it's not like someone else can fix this. We need to address it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, Suzanne, it's pretty hard to deny any longer. And um, and that it's a good thing that we're now making progress. And Jane, I'd just add that um, every American is worth about 25 people anywhere else in the world in terms of our impact, which means that everything that we do is that much more impactful. It's not meant as an elitist comment. It's just a fact. So we can actually have more impact on reducing and being a shining light to other people and creating the jobs and the venture capital, the new companies and kind of the transformation upside. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. It's actually some, some pretty great regenerative economics that go along with this transition. Yeah, and I, I will mention, I sit on the water board with a colleague by the name of Andy Gunther. Andy is a climate scientist. And when I spoke to him just last week, he sounded the most upbeat I have heard him sound in you know the past couple of years. And he said, you know, the good news is uh, everyone must do something and everyone can do something because everything is going to matter. So making whether it's a travel decision or improvements to your home or the choice of a car, all of these things help. So I think we have moved to the place where people can see that they can take action. And I, and I suspect this is true for Mark as well. I am getting emails and calls and texts every day about what should I read? What should I do? Where, where do I learn more? What programs are available? And that's, that's a big change. So that's good to see. I think that's a good takeaway that the, the conversation is so important. And it, boy, it sounds like a downer. It kind of feels like it's a crisis. It is what it is. Sure. Um, but just talking about it, gosh, at the dinner table, uh, talking about it at work, um, picking up the phone and or, or email, or whatever, talking to a representative right now is so important um, that, that we have this angst and a lot of it's hidden because we feel like it's a crisis and it's bad, we don't wanna bring it up. But there are solutions, there are positive things, there are intersections of other causes that we care deeply about. And having the conversation about the urgency to act now is so important. So just talking about it, I think what I've put on the table as uh, one of the really important sort of leadership opportunities here talking about it, posting about it, right? I mean, really elevating the issue and, and uh, tangible steps that we can take. Climate definitely has our attention right now. <laughs> this whole issue certainly does. You know, I wanna go back to, um, or just talk about, you know, the issue of how our culture really, especially over the last, I don't know, 100 years has just, um, you know, what, what have we done to this land as a people, right? Native Americans were stewards of this land and uh, certainly treated it very differently than, than we do. And it's, it's foundational to the culture and beliefs of indigenous people to care for the land, right? So as white leaders in this space, how do you work and lead with cultural humility while trying to remedy the mess, frankly, that we've created over the decades? You know, if Mark, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, and I'm very humble about this because I'm not an expert in indigenous peoples, uh, but I have great respect for the philosophy and the ethos of thinking seven generations ahead and of, of how people did used to, to live. Um, and now we need to apply some of the same philosophy um, with modern technology in mind as well. I was just, a, there's the California and United States version, but I was recently studying up on regenerative um, regenerative travel in New Zealand, where they're picking up some of the Mori um, native people's philosophy about the land, which is totally A, fascinating and B, beautiful, um, but talks about that kind of connection to um, natural resources and land and sustainability and respect for people all as one 
one set of ideas. Um, and there's a movement for the travel industry in New Zealand, which is huge in their economy, uh, to bring that to the fore, to really think about the operations of things like hotels and, and moving around and travel and recreation um, in, in the light of sustainability and getting to zero carbon and including that sense of what is the common good? How do we treat it? How do we treat each other, um, people and planet uh, together and, and creating a learning moment for people perhaps as they travel about how that native really um, um, uh, native in that case New Zealander uh, perspective uh, can be shared with people and I think it was a beautiful example of bringing some of these ideas together we should do the same indeed Jane anything to add to that you know, I guess, uh, as I shared with you and Mark, as we got on the call, I have a new grandchild that arrived on Saturday into the world. And I, you know, of course, these are the sorts of things that really make you think about the next generation and what we're leaving for this generation. And I think there is a lot to learn from the Native American community um, and to take some of the you know, take away some of their um, spirituality and their their thoughts about how to care for the earth and and looking forward to you know future generations. Um, so, like Mark, I feel very humble around this topic. I have done quite a bit of work with Native American communities, and um, there is so much to draw from. Um, but I think all of us also need to do some self reflection on both what we will take from the earth and what we will bring um, and and leave going forward that um, that we all have a lot to think about on this topic. Um, to be a generation that does not leave the world in a better place than the last generation is um, it's not really the the, uh, the tribute I would like to have. so I'm, I'm hoping we can we can do a better job in the next 30 years or so. One of the books that I know Jane and I really like, and it just came out in paperback, is called All We Can Save. It's a collection of articles, all by women authors of very diverse backgrounds, um, and edited by two women scientists who are fabulous. That's called All We Can Save, and several of the articles in, in that um, um, book are, are collections and from Indigenous peoples, and I learned a lot, back to the humility uh, part of this, but um, uh, there's just so much that we, we can learn from the old ways and bring to the new. Love it. And I want to give a plug to you for, you know, the work of the Sustainability Affinity Group, which the two of you have been uh, leaders in, very involved in, and I understand provides really a, a space right now for senior fellows who are uh, working hard in to address the, the climate crisis and sustainability to, to be together, to compare notes and gain support. So sh share a little bit about the work of that group and how folks might get involved. Um, so I'll start off. Um, I uh, The sustainability group is really a, a collection of senior fellows that are working in this space in public sector, private sector, either as their jobs or as their interest. And so the, the organization, um, we're meeting again, Mark, in what's the a date? Week. Yeah. A week, October 6th. Um, and we're really come together to support each other in large part because this is challenging work and it is um, both sometimes technically different, difficult, but also emotionally difficult as well. And, and we are also finding opportunities to connect between what different, whether you're working in food and agriculture or you're working in technology, there's ways that we can support each other and even, um, you know, connect across the different arenas. Yeah, um, one of the most important things all of us can do at work and as citizens in the, in the world uh, in terms of community action is to join others and help them be successful. Um, there are lots of solutions. There are lots of groups uh, of all manner that are trying to impact this. And what we don't need are a thousand more of them. We need the ones that exist to be a lot more effective. So part of our theme in the sustainability group is just been to understand what each other's doing. And to say, here's here's the help that I need, or I'd love I'd love for people to assist in this way, and for all of us to kind of jump on board and and, and be able to help. So a lot of what we're doing is that that type of sharing. A, a resource that just came out from Project Drawdown is called Climate Solutions at Work. How can every employee turn their job into a climate action job, no matter what the job is? 
and it's a, a, a great guide. Well, finding those kinds of gems and allowing people to help each other um, in small ways and large is, is super important. And um, we've also, in the, we'll see where this goes, but there are other ALF chapters who have great interest in sustainability too. So we're starting the process of creating a, a directory of ALF fellows, senior fellows who have a passion in some way about uh, sustainability and want to be able to connect to each other so that we could be more powerful as a group across the country. Um, so it's really it's really about how do we amplify and grow movements and large efforts that we're all involved in uh, to be bigger and more effective because of each other. Love it. Love it. No, I'm so glad that uh, you're connecting across chapters and excited for the work that you're doing and excited to be a small part of it here at, at, uh, at ALF. Um, you know, something you said too, Mark, just about the, the way that uh, New Zealanders think about this and, and sort of the approach, the mindset that they take and we too need to take really mirrors what we talk about in the fellows program, which is how do we make decisions based on what's best for the ecosystem versus the ego system. That's an Otto Scharmer uh, yeah. uh, quote. And, you know, otherwise we're going to find ourselves on the wrong side of history here. So with each decision that we make as senior fellows, um, what is the ripple effect, right? And what is the example that we're setting I know that we're going to publish a list of uh, sort of things that we should be listening to or reading right now based on your recommendations. But are there, you've, you've named a couple, any other kind of hot things that have come across your desk that, that you really um, recommend folks take a look at or listen to? Jane, do you have any? I, I have two that I'm going to suggest. One is... Um, in August of 2018, New York Times Magazine put out a long story. Uh, it's titled Losing Earth, the Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change. So if you want to sort of understand the history in a, in a pretty in-depth article uh, and sort of where we are now, it's an excellent source. The other is to suggest uh, we are very fortunate that in really every county in the Bay Area, we have an Office of Sustainability. And particularly in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, these offices, they are doing tremendous work to not only um, uh, uh, provide guidance on how individuals and organizations can act, but also as a resource for grant funding or other funding that might be available if you're an organization that you're looking to take on some of this or an individual. So those, um, those offices in the county can be really helpful. Yeah, and one of the things we've learned along the way with the sustainability affinity group is that there are two prongs to this uh, uh, kind of climate crisis response. One is remediation, um, meaning how do we stop carbon? The other one is adaptation, because as you mentioned at the top, Suzanne, a lot of this is baked in and it's going to get worse. And the question is how much worse? So uh, we're fortunate locally in Silicon Valley to have tremendous planning going on. And it's good to be aware and supportive of, of, of both sides of that. So I think Jane's suggestion is great. I think one of the challenges is there's too much to read and too much to <clears throat> to right. discover. Uh, and if I was to recommend two things right now, I would say all we can save is just a great multidisciplinary, multiple perspective way to fill out a broader view of what the climate crisis is about. And it's not a downer. So a lot of it's actually solution oriented in the upper. And the other one is to use drawdown.org as a way to reframe all of our thinking about the solution so that we can be um, activated on kind of price performance, best impact uh, that we can possibly have. And the last thing I'd say for the scientists and data people in the group is um, don't be afraid of the IPCC reports. Uh, they do a good job, the scientists from the UN, of uh, distilling down summaries of what, what does the data actually say. And uh, for those who are interested in that lens, um, totally worth uh, reading their you know, 10, 20 page uh, summaries. Thank you so much, Mark and Jane. Appreciate you sharing uh, your thoughts, your your uh, insights with us. And now, really, senior fellows and fellows, it's on us. We need to step up and and uh, and take action. And the good news is, there are things that we can all be doing. So, thanks, you guys. ALF joins and strengthens diverse leaders, creating and supporting networks for good. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. 
and encourage you to subscribe to The Dialogue on iTunes or SoundCloud. To learn more about ALF, visit us online at alfsv.org.